Hey, New Life, Pastor Dave, the online campus pastor here. Just wanted to welcome you to Church Online today. We really appreciate that you're joining us from your house. And while our area is under a state of emergency, we want to worship together as a family. So let's go ahead and receive God's word together. And to follow along with the sermon, you can find all of our notes on the New Life app or on Version's Bible app. And as you follow along with the services, feel free to connect with us through the chat room. If you have any personal prayer requests that you don't want to share publicly, you can message us privately. We will be praying for you specifically. We'd love to hear from you. And thanks again for joining us for the service. Uh, at the end of the message, don't go so fast. We have some announcements we want you to check out. But thanks again for being with us today and enjoy worship. God bless. What's up, New Life family? Wherever you are, let's worship together today. family, we just want to encourage you that no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what's going on at your house, that Jesus is here and that Jesus is King. Jesus is Lord. And we believe that our sovereign God has us and he holds us within his heart. 
Can we just begin just to sing to him? Break me out of these chains. Break me out of these walls around. Peace be here in this place. Break through the wreck it still face around. Come, Holy Spirit, through it all. In every rise and fall. I know you're in control, so be still, my soul, be still, my soul, be still, my soul, cause Jesus is here, that's the cry of our hearts, let's sing it out, break me out. Break me out of these chains. Break me out of these walls around. Peace be here in this place. Peace be here in this place. Break through the wreck you still face around. Come, Holy Spirit. family. It is so good to sing that song, Jesus is Here Together, because I say almost every week at the King George campus that God doesn't dwell in buildings. His spirit dwells in people, and, and it couldn't be any more true today as we worship all over the DMV together right in our own homes, and that God's Holy Spirit is right there with you now, and so let's pray together that God would move in power right where we are at. 
God, I want to thank you for this moment that we can share together with our families, our neighbors, wherever we may be gathered. God, thank you that you are a God who walks right with us, a God who dwells with us. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fill the room wherever we are sitting. And would you move in power today? We want to submit this time to you, trusting you in this moment and asking that you would bring us peace. So as we continue to worship and service, Holy Spirit, would you move in our hearts? Would you remind us of the freedom that we have in you? And we're going to give you the praise. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear no I am a child of God I'm no My mother's womb, from my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name, and I've been born again. Into your family, oh, your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer, I'm no longer a slave to fear. No, I am a child of God, and I'm no. Sing our freedom 
Hey, y'all, how you doing? It's good to see you here on, um, let's see, week two of our exile from church. So uh, I want to I greet you and welcome you to New Life, your house. Of course, we're not able still to meet at New Life La Plata, Calvert, uh, Alexandria, or, or King George. All of, our, all of our campuses are shut down. So you're gathered at New Life, your house. And whether you're at home with just you and your family or whether you've brought some folks around and you're doing a watch party, I just want to welcome you and I want to thank you for being part of what's going on. Listen, listen, the church is not about a building or a location. The church being the church in the, name of, in the name of Christ is something that can happen without a building or a location. This, when all this is over, we got to not neglect the gathering of ourselves together. We've got to come back together and worship. But while we are asked not to be here as a big group, there's still ministry you can do and there's still the word. I want to encourage you to stay engaged in what God's doing in your life. I also want to encourage you to give as we talk about. This would be the point in the normal service that I would talk about offering. We would bring the ushers down and we would take the offering. What we need to do is we need to ask you to go ahead and give. Remember, tithing is not something you give because of a service rendered. You don't tithe because somebody preached to you or somebody gave you a cookie or somebody opened a building for you. You tithe as part of your worship to the God that you serve. Therefore, I want to encourage you to give and give online. There will be ways to, to do that, and there will be folks that explain that to you at the, end of the, at the end of the sermon today. And I want to encourage you to be a part of that. Now, let me say one more time. If you are joining us because your church does not yet have online capacity, I want, I want you to hear me. I'm being very sincere. If you go to another church, do not send your tithe to us. Take your tithe to your church. They need it. All right. But if you attend New Life, if this is your normal church, I want to encourage you, you give here even though we're not able to gather. Now, we're, gonna, we're on week five of our series on Nehemiah, so I want to encourage you to grab the book. Uh, we have them at the church, of course, but you can order this at Amazon.com. They'll have it there or WesleyanPublishingHouse.com uh, as well. So, but Amazon has these. You can get it from there. So I want to encourage you to follow along as we do this. Let me, let me, let me remind you where we've been so I could take you where we're going. What we are talking about is taking authority over identity. And, and let, let me say this, I, I've forgotten to say this over the last few weeks, but let me make sure I get this in here. Every single one of us is caught in a cycle. That cycle might be good for you, that cycle might be bad for you. That cycle may be building you up or that cycle may be spiraling you down. Uh, whatever that cycle is, you're caught in it. And that cycle is caused by, is driven by, is empowered by the identity you've allowed to be put on your life. Either you've put it there because you, it's what you call yourself, or maybe the world has put it there because they labeled you, or maybe the enemy of your soul is lying to you and telling you that you are something that is not healthy, or you are something that is broken, or you are something that, that, that is not good good. I, I want you to understand the identity we allow to be put on us, the labels we allow to stick, they will determine where we go. My I am will determine my I will, all right? My identity will determine my destiny. Even if God has a different plan for me, if I take on a broken, false identity, I will frustrate God's plan in my life. That's why we've got to understand this. That's why I want you to draw this. Even at your house, I want you to practice drawing this because 
you're going to have a friend at some point or a family member at some point that's going to need this and you're not going to have a you're not going to have me around you're not going to have a video around you you're just going to have to draw it on a napkin but you can do this this does not take artistic ability watch i am my i am is first of all it is determined by the truth i accept watch the truth i accept as my identity becomes the truth of who I am. Watch, when I allow someone to stick a label on me, it establishes my inner truth. And my inner truth is what ultimately will establish the way I think about the world around me, which means, and I've said this over and over again, but you gotta get it. If I have a warped truth internally, it becomes the lens through which I see the whole world. So listen, if I have a warped truth internally, That lens will cause me to see the world in such a way that I will begin to believe a lie about myself. My lens will cause me to see the world in such a distorted way that even though it's a lie, I'll believe it. And I'll start to see the world in such a way that it it defends a lie. And all of a sudden, my thinking is messed up. My thinking will then establish my actions. And listen, If I'm looking at the world through a distorted lens, a distorted truth lens, therefore I've accepted a wrong identity, I'm seeing the world through this distorted truth lens, it's changing the way I think, now I'm actually gonna act out on an identity that's not even reality. It's not even true, and yet I'll act out in it. I'll I'll live it out. I'll actually, watch, it's it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'll actually make it true because I think it's true because I've accepted it as my label. The truth is you will end up acting out on things that you would never normally do if you had a proper identity in your life. Those actions ultimately become habits. Again, Again, if it's good for you, we call it a habit. And if it's bad for you, we call it an addiction. Either way, I'm trapped in it. Because if I've accepted that identity, I get trapped in it. And the world looks around and decides, well, I can't really change that. I can't do anything about that. I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I'm, I'm stuck. This must really be who I am because I can't get past it. And in the end, that's not true. What's true is you might need the Holy Spirit to break through. You might need eternity to break through your reality. You might need the divine to break through your natural. You might need Jesus to break through your life and your brokenness because once the blood of Jesus washes you clean and the power of the Holy Spirit changes your identity, your I am shifts from what you thought it was to what God always said it was. So now I can be reset, I can be restored, I can be remade, I can be redeemed. I can be bought out of what I was once broken in. And that's what God wants to do in our lives. Now, we've been doing this through the book of Nehemiah. And so in Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapter 13, we, we, it's, the, it's the last chapter of the book, and Nehemiah is dealing with the fact, watch, watch, watch. Nehemiah is dealing with the fact that everything he put into place has now fallen apart. Nehemiah is dealing with the fact that everything he thought he had fixed was now once again broken. Watch, I want to show you this. While all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. He went back to his day job. He went back to his real job. He's back to being, he's back to being the cupbearer to the king. He's back to being the king's bartender, if you will. So he's gone back to that job, and it says, sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. So Nehemiah has left Jerusalem, gone back to the king, And he's been with the king now for a few years, and then he asked for permission to come back to Jerusalem. So while he was gone, while he was gone, a lot of things started changing. While he was gone, the the, the Israelites, the the residents of Jerusalem, they forgot how he told them to live. They forgot why this was important. Y'all, 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 can I just say this? In the Old Testament, there's this pattern with the nation of Israel. They come to God, they serve their God, they worship their God, and they live out what their God tells them to do. And then they slowly forget their God and start following other gods. When they follow other gods, their blessings cease and they find themselves trapped, they find themselves broken, they find themselves in want, they find themselves in need. 
Then in their need, they cry out to their God. He restores them and they follow and worship their God and they are blessed again. Then they forget. This forgotten, Nehemiah could take it personally. You could take it personally. You could look at this thing and say, I fixed that. And then the people forgot what I told them to do. And when they forgot, they walked away from God. And now, you know what? I'm just a failure. I'm just a failure. But, but listen, listen, listen. This is a natural pattern. I want all of you to hear me. The, w- the way we need to see these Old Testament stories, and, and this, I've, I've taught you this over the years, is you see Jerusalem as an individual. And so what's happened is this individual Jerusalem has been restored back to its proper identity. It was broken, it was destroyed, it was in in disrepair, It, it 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 was in despair. But God restored them to their normal identity, their God given identity as God's people, and they followed him, and then all of a sudden they forgot him and now they're sinking back toward that despair where they were before. Our lives can do that. Our lives can do that. And honestly, we could feel like a failure because we've forgotten to follow our God. Watch, I want to show you something else. It says, and, and came back to Jerusalem. This is, he asked for the king's permission and he came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib have done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. <laughs> Y'all, Tobiah. Remember, remember, remember Tobiah? Samballot, Tobiah, Geshem? They're all coming against the work. They are opposed to the security and the blessing of Jerusalem. They want to steal from Jerusalem. Eliashib here, Eliashib, he's the high priest. What he's done, because somehow he's related to Tobiah. So he has now allowed, watch, he has allowed Tobiah, the enemy of God's people, to store his stuff in the temple of God. Watch, watch. Sometimes we allow the enemy of our souls to store his garbage in our hearts. And when we do that, we'll find that we have forsaken what God has called us to. We have forsaken. In fact, how crushed must Nehemiah be? He's already been here. He's purified this. He's cleaned the place out. He set the walls back up. He's blocked out Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. He's kept them out. He's protected the city only to come back and find that the temple now has a whole section of it full of Tobiah's stuff. All of a sudden, the ones he, he sent away, he, the ones he was protecting Jerusalem from are right in the center of where God should be worshiped. And, and Nehemiah's gotta be going, I am just completely forgotten. And for a second, what in the world have I done? I, I, I haven't accomplished anything. I want, I, want all of you, I want all of you to hear me. I've worked, I've been a pastor for more than 30 years and I've worked with pastors for, for, for that long. And it's tough to sometimes sit down with a pastor and say, how's it been going? Especially, especially somebody that's been serving for 30, 40 years. And they look at you and say, everything I've ever taught them, they've forgotten. And everything I've ever tried to get them to do, they've forsaken. Now, this is a very discouraging place for a pastor to be. But listen, I'm not just talking about pastors because I could tell you that there are parents who are living in this place. They feel like they're a failure because it seems like their kids have forgotten and forsaken everything that parent ever tried to teach them. They feel like a failure because everything they've tried to, they've tried to teach their family is forgotten or forsaken. I, I, see, I, see, I see counselors that feel this way. Because they've said over and over again, do this, do this, do this, and, and it's forgotten and forsaken. I, I see business owners forgotten and forsaken. I, look, all of us have this moment where, like Nehemiah, we, we walk back to something we fixed, and it's broken again. If that's you, be encouraged today. The pattern of leaving God and coming back, the pattern of leaving wrong and coming back to wrong, the pattern of, doing, of going back and forth between the godly and the ungodly, the right and the wrong, that pattern is normal and natural. 
I'm not saying it's okay that we fall away. I'm not some, somehow trying to, give, trying to give, give a pass to everybody who falls away and say, oh, you're just going to come on back. I'm not doing that. But I am telling you as a leader in any, in any form at any level, this is going to happen. Now, let me say this in a different way. Let me show you this in a different way. When you forget God and you forsake God's commands, you will find failure being your normal pattern in life. You see how I just can turn that? I can turn it and show you that when you walk away from what's right in your life, from what's godly in your life, from what's righteous in your life, you'll start to look around and see failure starting to take over. Do you know why? Because the devil doesn't want you to be a success. He wants you to be a failure because he wants to destroy you. He has only come to kill, kill, steal, and destroy. And that's what he's trying to do in your life. You've got to not let this happen. Watch, I want to show you something. I am a failure? No, not in God's sight. In God's sight, I am restored. I am restored, I am remade. Watch, Nehemiah does not look at it. Watch, he could have. He could have shown up in Jerusalem all those years later and went, are you kidding me? You people went right back? You put this Tobiah in the temple? I can't even believe you let him in the gates, much less let him in the temple. You let him put his stuff in there? Are you kidding? kidding me? I, he could have said, I'm done with you, got back on his horse and gone back home. But he didn't do that. He didn't choose to do that. He said, no, we're going to restore this. That's what God, look, listen, 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 everybody hear me. That's what God does with you. God could look at you and say, are you kidding me? I just cleaned that whole heart of yours up. And now all of a sudden you're back. Are you kidding me? You let the devil put that back in your heart. You're storing his stuff in your heart. Are you kidding? He could do that and say, I'm done with you, but he doesn't. He doesn't say you're a failure. I'm walking away. He says, no, no, no. You've messed up. Now I'm going to restore you. Look, I was greatly displeased. Now, now let me pause. Let me pause. Let me pause. Sometimes I think we get this image of God. That, that, that God is never, how do I say this, displeased with us. But the truth is that he is. The Bible tells us that God can even be angry with us. The good news is he's a God of mercy and love, and so his mercy and love always comes back and overtakes that, especially in a, in a New Testament relationship that we have with God. So, so it says, I was greatly displeased. Watch what God wants to do. Y'all, y'all, stay with me now. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. God, God looks at us and says, I'm not happy about this. And what you got to do is take all that garbage you let the enemy put in your heart and you got to throw it out. This is not a matter of managing the stuff that's in your heart. This is a matter of ejecting the stuff that's in your heart. He says he threw it out. I gave orders to purify the rooms and then I put back into them. Watch. He did, look, throw it out, clean it up, and then refill it with the right stuff. You see how that's working? I, then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. In other words, you can't just, you can't just throw that stuff out and leave the space empty. Otherwise, something else is going to come back in and fill it. And what comes in the second time is going to be worse than what was there the first time. What you got to do is you got to empty it out and you've got to put godly things back in its place. I, I often say to people who are trying to get, get over addiction. The, when, you are, when you have an addiction and you, you try to put it down, smoking, drinking, whatever it might be, you try to put that down, there are triggers that cause you to desire what you are addicted to. And if you're, I've, heard, I've heard people say that, that with smoking, they, they like to have a cigarette after they eat. So when they eat, it's a trigger to go back to a cigarette. Okay, But, but, but look, that, that desire, that trigger is not going to go away. What you have to do when you remove the cigarette from the trigger, the trigger doesn't go away. What you have to do is replace your reaction to it with something new. That's why so many, that's why so many who are letting go of, of smoking will pick up things like chewing gum or something. They'll, they've got to replace the trigger. They've got, to, they've got to replace it with something that they can do instead, and it, and it satisfies that trigger. Y'all, y'all, you can't just empty a room and leave it empty. It doesn't work that way. It'll get filled back up. Watch. 
I am restored. I got to change my truth and my thinking, which means I've got to have a renewed focus, put my focus on something godly, put my focus on something healthy, put my, replace the reaction to the trigger. Instead of having something there that is killing me, put something there that is building me. Instead of having something there that is sinful, put something there that is godly. And what God will do as you do that is he'll continue to build you in that moment. And that trigger that was leading you to death can now lead you to growth and life if you allow it to do so. If you replace your reaction to it positively. What Nehemiah did was he came in, he, he, he threw all the old stuff out, he cleaned it up, and then he replaced the trigger. He replaced the reaction, my truth and my thinking. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. In other words, worship was not happening. Nothing was had the real you say, well, how do they even have room for all the Tobias stuff in the tabernacle in the temple? Well, the answer is because they were holding church. Y'all, 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 watch, 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 watch. You gotta have a renewed focus, focus and you've gotta have a refined plan. You gotta change your plan because what's happened is you've, you've neglected, you've let something of God fall into disuse when you fall into this pattern. And when so, look, watch, watch. When the space in your life that is meant for God falls into disuse, the enemy of your soul will begin to take over that space with his own things, his own ideas, his own way of understanding things. The way you fix that is, is, is you've got to have a new plan. You've got to have a new way of doing things. You've got to shift things. Listen, listen. The Holy Spirit gives you the power to change, but you must do the work of making things change with his power lifting you up while you do it. So whatever it is, look, look, look. If you've got things in your life that are causing your focus to be on something other than the God, throw them out, purify the space, put something godly back in there. And then make sure that you have spiritually guarded the God areas of your life and gone back to patterns of action that cause you to worship and make you better. There's got to be another plan. Hey, hey, everybody, don't, don't react. Don't react. Do not elbow your neighbor. Mm -mm. I know you're at home, but no, no, don't do it. Hear me out. You've got to have a better plan because the one you've got right now isn't working. When you're, when you're stuck in a place where the plan you've got right now isn't working, you got to make a new one. Watch. I'll show you something else. So I rebuked the officials, Nehemiah says. He rebuked the officials and asked them, I love this phrase. you got to hear this question. Why is the house of God neglected? Hey, church, we cannot neglect the house of God even when the doors, when the physical doors can't be open. We cannot neglect the worship of God. We cannot neglect going to God's word. We cannot neglect getting our church on however we can do that. You're doing that by watching online. This is what we're doing. But we cannot neglect the house of God. Then I called them together and stationed them at their post. In other words, he called back the pastors and the staff and put the church back to work. He said, we've got to get back to serving our God, we've got to get back to worshiping our God. We've got to get God actively returned to the center of our existence. And that's the, that's the, that's, that is Jerusalem. At the very center of the city is the temple. And that is, that is important. At the very center of the city is God. So many old towns in Europe, old towns in the U.S., when you go to the old section of town, right in the middle of town, there's always a church. Why? Because they wanted to make the point God is at the center of our lives. And in your personal life, you've got to get back to that. Watch. Our habits and actions, we've got to rediscover a balance in our lives. So watch, watch, watch. I want to show you this. There's got to be balance. Often in our lives, when we walk away from what is righteous and what is holy and what is true, we, we neglect the spiritual by neglecting the spiritual, we cause our lives to fall out of balance. 
When you neglect the spiritual, when you neglect God in your life, your life cannot be balanced. Watch, you, 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 need to, you need to be mentally building yourself, physically building yourself, and spiritually building yourself. If you neglect any of those three parts of who you are, you will fall out of balance. The most common neglected part in our culture today is the spiritual part. We work on our physical, we work on our mental, we try to be smarter, we try to be healthier, but we've got to be better spiritually as well. And if we fall out of balance, if we don't call back the worship of our God, if we don't call back the centrality of our God, if we don't call back the, God's word, if we don't call back God's worship, if we don't call back God's presence, our lives fall out of balance. And when our lives are out of balance, we cannot find a healthy expression of who God made us to be. We've got to live back in balance. Now watch what he says. All Judah, in other words, all of, all, well, in other words, everybody living in Jerusalem and the surrounding area, brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil into the storerooms. In other words, they began to worship again. How did they measure that? They measured that because people, watch, they had a rediscovered balance and they had reestablished the generosity in their hearts. Look, it's not about money. It's not about giving money. It's not, that's, not, that's not the point. It's about being generous. It's about taking care of people. Look, can I be honest? Even now. Even now, when, we're, when, we, when we're, we have the doors shut, when, 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 the, when, when the coronavirus and the situation has caused us not to be able to open the doors of the church, you know what? We've still got to be generous. We've still got to find balance. This is why. This is why. And, and listen, let me just say, thank God for our staff. But this is why our staff has every day provided things for you online. Every day has given you experience. Every evening during the week, there's a prayer experience. Every, I, I hope you're connecting with all this stuff. This is why all this is here is because we've got to have that balance in our lives even when we can't physically come to a place, a building called a church. We still have to be the church. It also means we've got to find ways. Not just to give to the church, which we can do online, but to help our neighbors, to, to, to lift up other people up, to make sure people have what they need in moments of crisis. That's all got to be there because that's what God has called us to do. That's what the church is. I'm going to be very honest. This period of time when we are forced to close the doors of the church could be one of the most healthy things that happened to us. Because we'll be forced to be the church without walking into a building. And if we can do that, we'll actually live this out. And the church itself could be restored. You could be restored. And all of a sudden, the people around you will look at you and say, what changed? And your answer will be, you know, I realized I was letting the enemy in my soul store his junk in my heart. And I threw it out. And I purified the space and then I replaced, I replaced it with godly things. I changed the way I think. I changed the way I act. I restored the balance back and now God's giving me the power through the presence of the Holy Spirit in me to do the right thing and to actually help people. Wouldn't that be a great testimony? Don't you want that to be your testimony? <laughs> I have to be honest. In the end, people don't remember how much money you stacked up. They don't remember how many houses you had, and they don't remember how many vacations you took. In the end, people remember that through the power of the Holy Spirit living in you, you not only restored yourself, you restored them. And you brought them from failure to restoration in Christ. That's what God's called us to. Let me pray for you. Holy Spirit, in this moment, wherever we happen to be sitting, would you, would you guide us? Show us, Lord, the rooms in our hearts where we've allowed the devil to put his stuff. Lord, show us how to clean that out and throw that stuff out. Help us, Lord, to purify that space. You, Lord, through, by your blood, purify that space. Holy Spirit, help us to replace our reaction to negative triggers with your strength, with your call, with following your voice. 
Lord, let us restore balance in our lives and let us be generous with all that you've given us. We praise you, God, for what you're going to do. Take us from failure to restoration and we will give you glory and honor. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, it's Haley. Thanks for joining us online for church today. We hope you enjoyed the service. While we cannot gather together in person, we will be putting out daily content on YouTube, Facebook, and our app. Be sure to download the app and turn on push notifications. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook as well. Also on the app, you can find our online store where we will sell merch, apparel, and books. We are ready to take online orders and deliver items directly to your house. The proceeds will help fund New Life's original music. While we're apart, we have three ways for you to give. You can give on the app, on the website, or by texting your amount to 84321. Thanks again for joining us. To learn how you can receive communion this weekend, stay tuned for the next video. Hey, New Life, we want to announce a, a, a plan that we have for this coming Sunday. A plan to have drive-through communion at our La Plata campus, our main La Plata campus. Now, we've cleared this with the local authorities. They have approved it. Here's how it's going to work, and you need to be very careful that you, that you know what's going to happen, okay? What we want to do is we want to invite you to come to church on Sunday between 1 and 4 in the afternoon. Between 1 and 4 in the afternoon. You'll drive in, and you'll come in. Watch. Here's our map. 301 is here. The dome building is here. This is the office building. This is the chapel building, and this is, the, ma this is the, the main sanctuary building. As you come in, you'll come in, and there'll be someone right here directing you to turn right and drive in front of the dome and around, okay? As you drive around, there will be somebody here just at the front edge of the, large, of the, of the main sanctuary building right here. They will stop you. Now, hear me. When you stop in the line, do not park your car and do not get out of your car. Remain in your car at all times. You will stop here so that someone can direct you to the next available pastor who will be providing communion. When they tell you to go forward, you will be directed into one of these five lanes that we have in our back parking lot. As they direct you into these lanes, there will be a pastor stationed at each one. That pastor will walk up to the driver's side window. You'll roll down the window. The pastor will not touch you. You are not to touch the pastor. I'm sorry. I don't mean for it to be like this, but it's the world we're in right now. The pastor will provide you communion using one of these. This is a, this is a completely self-contained communion kit. When you peel off the top layer here, you will, you will find the bread and the top. When you peel off the bottom layer, there is the juice in the bottom. That pastor will walk you through communion, taking the body and then taking the blood, and we will do that together. That pastor will then pray for you and your family, and you pray for any personal requests you have. He will pray over you, over your family, over everyone in the car, and anything you ask them to. When you are done with communion and prayer, you will exit back out and again go out and around the building up this side and back out onto 301. Let me emphasize again, you're never to park your car. You're never to get out of your car. The pastor will not touch you. The pastor will give you communion this way. He will be wearing gloves when he hands you this. You are not to touch the pastor. The pastor probably will not even touch your car. And the truth is we will be face to face, but we will maintain enough space that we do not promote the spread of this disease. And yet, we will provide communion and we will worship our God together on the property he gave us as holy ground. I, wanna, I want you to know we're praying for you. And I want you to know we're gonna be with you all the way through this. This will end. God will see us through this. And I look forward to the first day we get back together and worship our God together at church. Be the church till you can go to church. We're praying for you.